Hello and welcome to today's webinar, DAS, Key to Multi-Carrier Indoor and Public Venue Mobile Coverage. As a couple of technical points, um, this webcast will be um, available on demand afterwards and if you do have any technical issues, please log off and log back into the system again and that should erase most of the technical issues. I'll now hand you over to Kush Boo, the conference producer at Avrin Events. Hello everyone and welcome to the DAS webinar. My name is Kush Boo Sega and I'm the senior producer for Avrin Events. Um, I'm sure you're aware that Avrin is running the Small Cells America Summit which is taking place um, from the 1st to the 3rd of December this year in Dallas. Um, which will be an exclusive partnership with the Small Cell Forum. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar today on DAS Key to Multi-Carrier Indoor and Public Venue Mobile Coverage. Um, for this webinar, we have Sue Rudd from Strategy Analytics and Derek Smith from at and um, who will be addressing a range of um, key questions about the future of DAS. Um, I would now like to hand over to Derek Smith, who is the Area Manager of at and Antenna Solutions Group. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, again, my name is Derek Smith. I'm the area manager for our national technical standards team here within our antenna solutions group at AT&T, primarily focusing on, on DADS and, and indoor small cells. Um, and want to first thank everybody for joining, and, and hopefully you guys get a lot out of this, uh, this webinar. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. The way that I that I figured I would start off not knowing, you know, everybody's uh, uh, overall expertise in, in the wireless and in, in, in DAS industry. Uh, to talk a little bit about the wireless landscape and, and the need for DAS. Um, over the past uh, five to six years, we've really seen a large majority of our uh, usage go to indoor. Potentially, um, eighty percent of the uh, traffic that we have, especially on the AT&T network, has been for uh, indoor uh, users. And that data traffic has increased more than 20,000% on our network alone. So people are no longer just using the Internet at the home or office. They are, they're doing it wherever they are with their mobile devices, whether they may be at a football game, at a uh, mall, at a... Um, um, other venue, conference, and such. So basically we're trying to help to enable the shift for uh, usage of these mobile devices by putting in place new technologies such as distributed antenna systems or what we typically call DAS um, so that we can uh, boost the mobile coverage indoors and have it more reliable for those heavily traffic areas that we may enhance the network capacity and, and take some capacity off our, of our macro network. So from a DAS perspective, what, what is it? Um, basically, you can look at a, at a distributed antenna system as a way to strategically place our antennas, which radiate um, RF energy, to distribute the wireless network services throughout a venue. Um, here you have pictured a actual office building, um, and this is just one type or one of our verticals that we typically cover here uh, at AT&T. Uh, but basically you have different components associated with a, a DAS system. Now a distributed antenna system can be either be what we call active, where we have components that require a separate input power source such as transceivers and amplifiers, or you can have a passive DAS, which is, does not necessarily require any input power source, where you can utilize things like coax cables, splitters, couplers, in order to distribute that RF energy throughout a particular venue. Uh, typically, for a lot of our DAS systems, what we're typically going to have, we're going to have one, one primary location within a, a venue. That's what we call our equipment room, and that's where we're going to house a lot of our uh, RAN and DAS equipment that that's necessary for um, spreading throughout the building. Um, you also have fiber optic cable in a lot of instances, depending upon the type of DAS that you have, um, remote units, coax cable going out to your antennas. Um, the key thing about a distributed antenna system is to 
attempt to make that the antenna system transparent to the mobile devices. So what you want to have the user think is that they're still using the same type of system or same they're getting the same performance off the system as they would a, a macro system. Um, and typically when we deploy these systems, it's going to be a, a uh, little bit more expensive because we have to do a lot more internally to the building and installing the actual equipment, like running the cable, co coax, and fiber is going to be the most labor-intensive part of that deployment. So a DAS is, a DAS is something that's very, um, very useful, especially when, when we're dealing with, like, taking capacity off our, off our macro network and putting it on a system that's dedicated and can support and provide the customers within that building or, or venue with a dedicated system to use for, for themselves. Now, typically for, for our distributed antenna systems, the first thing that we typically look at is what are, what are our customers experiencing? Um, how are they being impacted by the current macro network, and what are they missing? Um, are they having block calls? Are they having poor coverage? Are they having drop calls, access failures, low throughput? Um, those are the things that we use as our triggers in terms of whether or not we need to deploy a distributed antenna system um, in, a, in a typical area. Now, once we implement that DAS, that allows us to, to capture, capture more customers, um, in, enhance our wireless coverage, and provide them with a couple of benefits that we typically were, were not able to provide them previously, such as increased voice and data accessibility, uh, improved speeds on the network, improved coverage, and then being able to also provide them with a safety perspective where now our customers are able to, if, if necessary, uh, dial things like 911 and, and have that capability in, in that venue. So, so how does it work? Um, I think on the slide deck that you guys are probably seeing, I can't see it on the, on the, um, on the webinar, but the slide deck also has some verbiage around these, these items that are highlighted here. As, and what I really wanted to get out of this slide was primarily to allow you to understand the three primary components for a DAS system. Um, the first part is, is our um, head-end piece that's down here at the bottom, which, which allows us to connect our RAN equipment or our um, note bees, e note bees directly to the DAS head-end that's going to do a lot of the conditioning of the RF signal, uh, convert it, com convert it um, so it can be transmitted via fiber optics up to the, the remotes that will overall distribute the signal um, out to the antenna uh, and, and convert it back to RF. So these are the three primary components, and the radio transceivers or other equipment located at the head end um, that's at the bottom there promotes and processes controls that the communication signals that are going to be transmitted throughout the DAS and um, basically have, gives you the ability to amplify, filter, and combine the services at the remote end and transmit it through, through the antenna. Now, there are, there are different, different kinds of antennas that can be used in a typical deployment. This is, this is one for a a building system, but um, there are other types of antennas that can be used here, um, either omni antennas, uh, directional antennas, depending upon the, the deployment. In stadiums, you will primarily see more um, directional antennas uh, such that you can kind of shape the, shape the coverage area as necessary for a, um, a particular venue. One of the key things that impacts what type of antennas that we typically use for DAS is going to be the, the venue owner's um, uh, ability to allow us to, to put antennas where we need to put them. So that's one of the key things that we typically look at when um, deploying a DAS system, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about the, um, the considerations a little bit later. Um, 
Well, I guess it, it shows up as a uh, <laughs> as a uh, animation. Uh, but the the key opportunities for DAS, and, and I tried to break this down in, into venue types that that are, that are both uh, national and kind of international, because I know we have some people uh, on the uh, webinar that are international. One of our biggest key areas that we typically deal with on the DAS side are stadiums, arenas, convention centers, and then like airports. Uh, those are our really big areas with regards to to DAS that we deal with. And, and the primary reason is because a lot of those have a higher than normal user density that requires us to have a, a, um, a higher gain system a higher, a higher capacity system in place, such that we can support the amount of traffic in those in those high user density areas. Um, typically, those are also going to be areas where you have um, a lot of lower mobility situations um, that we don't have to worry about the mobility aspect as much. And those are ones where we also have a potential to have higher data rates. Um, in some of our other areas that are mentioned below, like office building, retail, industrial, campuses, we've started to look at um, utilization of more small sales um, for, those, for those general areas. And also, in some cases, we may implement a, um, a DAS to support that. Uh, so that's, that's, um, those are, these are the key areas of market opportunities that we from an AT&T perspective, have looked at um, deploying DAS systems and also um, small cell systems to to support the coverage and capacity needs that we have for the system. Um, now I'm going to pass it over to Sue Rudd, um, who is going to talk a little bit about some of the drivers for deploying DAS systems. Thank you very much indeed, Derek. Uh, really appreciate uh, the overview. I'm Sue Rudd with Strategy Analytics. I'm Director of Wireless Networks and Platforms. We work a lot on what are the new technologies that are going to deliver all the traffic that users are demanding. And in fact, we just issued our new traffic forecast. And we're seeing a tremendous consumerization of the indoor use with business people bringing their own consumer-related devices, the BYOD market, as it's called, bring your own device, where corporations are finding that their, their own employees are bringing huge amounts of uh, d uh, devices and needing huge amounts of capacity, both Wi-Fi and mobile, indoors in the building. And one of the challenges has been that they don't necessarily know which operator their employees are going to be using. So DAS has really established itself, I think, as the key solution where you need what is called a neutral host. In other words, you may have employees who are using one, any one of four or five vendors that are, have macro cell coverage in the area. So the ability of DAS to be a neutral host has been one of its big differentiators. The other one, as, as uh, Derek alluded to, was that the largest installations, this is really an efficient solution, wherever you can justify uh, the fiber in the risers or the fiber around a stadium or the fiber along the terminals of the airport, because you've got the kind of high traffic capacity, these are the sweet spots for the DAS deployment. Because covering that cost and then finding a way to share it across the, the both the, the venue and the operators that are bearing some of the cost of the installation is a really critical part. But getting to that critical mass is where DAS has tended to be a high-end solution. So similarly, it has typically t tended to be appropriate where you have a single corporation, particularly a large corporate e enterprise that has its own major corporate headquarters. And for instance, where they may actually be able to do some backhaul fiber and with some of the newer fiber technologies, the DWDM technology, you can potentially start to share the backhaul of the base station to the tower 
to with in fact with other traffic we're starting to finally see the ability to do that but typically das is required um the same kind of things that are required for uh, dedicated uh, remote base stations and remote radio heads with what's called cipri as a proprietary protocol running on its own fiber so the economics of the fiber connectivity both within the building and to the building are a really important part of that so Typically, it's been associated with buildings where there is already that kind of high-speed connection. And, of course, campuses, which very often will have a high-speed fiber connection, and large multi-tenant buildings where there is a landlord who can make the same kinds of decisions that a large corporation could make for the whole building. Just to see what that looks like, I put in a, an example here. Um, this is a nice one put together with a little a company called CHR Solutions that actually does a lot of rural and smaller operators support systems. Um, they've been very much focused on the ability to remote some of the mobile infrastructure and then share it across a number of users. And in this example, they put together a nice diagram. You see at the top, you have a stadium, and then you have these high-rise buildings, which look like the one that Derek put, and each one of those will have uh, fiber in the risers to connect the DAS across all floors, and they're showing here that it could be WDM or uh, CWDM technology. And then we have a whole bunch of, of areas, and as, uh, as you can see, this uh, can actually include some multi-tenant service areas around the fiber ring in this metro area. Or it could be a station, it could be an airport, and you bring all of this back to um, the host aggregation, uh, which is typically what we call DAS head-end solutions in the buildings, and then bring it back with digital transport to the macro infrastructure. So DAS really needs to be viewed as an integral part of your macro deployment, but it can get significant reuse through dropping the power. Originally, DAS used to take a sector of the radio frequency and only you were essentially taking that away from the macro cell. Now with much lower power solutions uh, and things like Ericsson's a modified DAS solution like Radio Dot, you're starting to see in-building use actually give some incremental uh, spectral efficiency and spatial reuse for the in-building solution. Um, I thought a nice picture would be good for, um, and these, there was an Urban Land magazine, believe it or not, of all publications, put in an article from Crown Castle, another one of the tower providers. American Tower is also known for, for supporting these kind of inf uh, deployments. But they show a very nice example. If you look at the picture here of this very elegant um, commercial building, um, but in the ceiling you see the little, little round raised uh, hub that is in fact where the antennas for, for the DAS system are. And basically they, they're showing it how nice it can look within, a, within an existing building. And the article is called Raising Bars in Commercial Buildings. I think indoor coverage is something we've all encountered. So this is really now getting adopted and embedded by the architecture community, if you want to think about that way. And this is really part of a building infrastructure that can be designed in and really made to look architecturally very pleasing. Uh, the diagram on the right, sh uh, pardon me, on the left shows the just the simple, relatively simple view of the same infrastructure source with the redistribution on every floor from from the central site. The other major and probably the one that most people have, have heard of in the last few years is all of the major stadiums, and I think in part in the U.S., um, uh, at and has played a major role in getting a large number of the stadiums to uh, ha have a DAS installation. This may in many cases be complementary to the Wi-Fi that's in the stadium, but it is really one of the most efficient ways to give peak load capacity for often for events that may last only eight hours a week week where you want to actually redirect the radio frequency and reassign it only for the period during which the uh, uh, the game is going on on a Sunday afternoon or Monday or whenever it is. But these are very strange traffic environments because they've got huge demands of capacity, including uplink as well as downlink capacity, but required for very short periods and often at a time when the macro network itself is not that busy. So DAS has been a perfect solution solution for reassigning macro bandwidth, often with what they call cell-on-wheels uh, equivalent of technology, but br 
bringing it to the DAS head end so that you can, in fact, have the spectrum reuse that's very efficient during the game with enormous capacity for very short periods. And again, if you look at the example on the right, you can actually see hanging from the rafters above the, above the second tier here um, where we see the actual installation of the DAS. This one, the one on the right is Chicago Soldiers Field Road. Um, the one on the left is what's now called 49ers Stadium in San Francisco. So we're seeing a lot of really practical installations. But there are some problems, and I'll just end this section and hand it back to Derek uh, for some additional comments. Um, but while we are looking at this, there's a lot of wire to be pulled, and I think as Derek alluded to, uh, we've, uh, the, one of the big labor costs is the installation of this. The simplicity and the ease and the total transparency of the resulting solution is accompanied by actually having to install quite a complex infrastructure. And so if there is an issue with this, it's really Really that there is a lot of wire in this wireless solution. So with that, let me hand it back to Kush to invite you to put questions in. Um, yes, you will see that there is a box at the bottom of the webinar. Um, please do hand in your questions there, which we will try and go through um, after um, Derek and Sue are done with their presentation. Um, if there are certain questions that are not answered, um, please do keep in mind that you can send them across to us and we are more than happy to put you in touch with either Sue or Derek to answer those questions if necessary, or they will be able to answer those um, questions by just clicking answer on separate questions uh, if that is the case. I'll now hand over back to Derek Smith. Okay, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I've, I've been through and, and start answering some of those questions that are being submitted. So um, some pretty good questions out there um, with regards to what's already been presented. Um, one of the key things that we typically look at from a, a DASH perspective and, and even from a small cell perspective is how do we, how do we want to deploy a, a DASH or, or a small cell system? There are numerous things that we look at with regards to that, um, whether it be design, design constraints, um, presence of other systems like Wi-Fi, and we've gotten several questions with regards to that, with regards to Wi-Fi. And, you know, Wi-Fi typically for us is an offload uh, system um, that's outside of our, our typical DASH deployments. So they're not, the traffic for both are, is, is totally separate. Uh, but we do include that in our analysis for um, capacity um, in terms of how what percentage we anticipate for Wi-Fi. Um, macro network interactions, that's very key for us um, in terms of our deployment considerations. Our our design targets, um, how are we designing the system, what, what capacity are we trying to meet, um, what type of coverage do we want to have. Um, each one of those is, is different for for CDMA versus UMTS versus LTE um, in terms of the, the technology that we use, um, the technology that we will have on the system with regards to a neutral host scenario. Um, each, each wireless carrier may have a different technology that they're using. Um, spectrum positioning, that's very big for us in terms of our consideration. Um, all that stuff kind of adds into overall how do we package up a data system and provide the necessary coverage and capacity that's needed for a wireless implementation. Um, one of the one of the key questions that that comes up a lot, um, especially now, uh, with regards to how do we define when we want to use DAS versus when we want to use small cell. Um, overall, we typically look at a couple of things with regards to DAS and small cell. One of the key things that we look at first is financials. Um, how do we, you know, what's it going to cost for a DAS? What's it going to cost with regards to a small cell? Um, that's one of the key things that we look at. Then we look at, you know, coverage versus capacity inside the venue. As I stated before, um, anywhere from over 80% of our users are indoors demanding that we provide the same type of coverage, same performance as they would on the macro network. So that's another key that we look at. Then we also look at improved user experience. Um, how are we going to improve the user experience indoors um, with regard to that as a small cell? Are, are we going to need the necessary capacity required that we would typically have on the macro? Or can we utilize small cells 
with a, a lesser of a capacity hit um, and more of a coverage type scenario um, to make sure that we have adequate coverage and capacity indoors and give us a, a strong comparative advantage. Um, deployment, time to deployment. Typically for a DAS system, um, the deployment times are extremely long. Um, that can be anywhere from six months to a year, depending upon the type of DAS and the venue type and, and interactions with the venue owner. From a small cell perspective, that time frame can go down anywhere from two months to, to uh, four months um, in terms of a solution being deployed to meet the urgent demands and capacity needs for a customer especially when we're talking about trying to retain customers. Um, backhaul is also very key to this. Um, typically for a, a DAS deployment, backhaul timelines are, are, are our long, long pole in the tent. Um, and, it, and it really uh, just basically depends upon the challenges that we're trying to implement to, to get the backhaul in place. Um, and then, like I said before, economic viability. Small sales versus DAS, um, building size, structure, capacity, all that pushes the envelope in terms of determining the expense versus the effort required to provide a solution to a customer. So that's how we typically look at when to use and how to use small sales versus DAS to meet the needs of our customers. Now, when we look back and, and look forward, um, I kind of tried to put together a, a couple of points here with regards to how we've done things in the past and then also, you know, how and it kind of blends into what we're doing right now to what we're looking forward to in 2020. As most of you probably already know from an AT&T perspective, by the year 2020, we're anticipating to have um, an all-IP network. Um, and what that will do will give us a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, wide-scale, heterogeneous-type networks that we can deploy to meet the needs of our customers. Um, but, you know, back in 2005, 2006, we, when we started deploying our UMTS network, um, it was more so about, you know, large macro cells providing outdoor coverage. And, you know, at that time, we also had limited um, solutions with, with regards to backhaul. Um, some of those have changed now. We've got couple of better solutions with regards to backhaul capacity and solutions. And, and it was more so about, you know, just giving our customers coverage. Um, now it's more so about how do I give them coverage, how do I give them the capacity they need, especially with a lot of the mobile applications that we have out there, and provide them with an environment that can be uh, self-organizing, um, providing them with, you know, interference coordination and cancellation so that they get the best performance in a numerous type of RF environments. Um, so that's really the key part here in, in terms of our future implementation is, is how do we manage our network better, manage it smarter, uh, be able to provide the implementations needed such that our users are, are given the best performing network possible, uh, utilizing uh, advanced technologies um, uh, via LTE and, and being able to uh, dispel the, the myth that, that small cells uh, cannot be configured and, and implemented um, uh, to meet the needs of our customers along with the, along with the DAS. Um, so now I want to turn it back over to um, Sue uh, for some final thoughts as well. Thank you very much, Derek. Yes, taking off from that point, we tried to put together um, some comparisons of where and when you might want to choose these different signals or different systems for enhancing the indoor signal strength and giving better coverage as well as capacity. 
And what we put together here, and again, this is an, an initial cut. These economics are changing by the moment. And uh, one of the interesting uh, things that we're seeing is a sort of more of a continuum of solutions rather than a, these are mutually exclusive alternatives. I did add in here in the first row of the chart um, the signal booster solution, which is probably the simplest thing an organization and corporation can do for themselves just to regenerate the signal. But more, most recently, we have now seen some digital signal booster solutions so that you can literally extend the solution from a window across the office uh, or make sure that you have coverage at least for a couple more of the offices. But this is a temporary ad hoc but relatively inexpensive and fa very fast to install solution. But we are seeing digital versions that now give um, a good, good radio answer for the user treating it as just a, a signal regeneration problem. Um, now, but more importantly, where does DAS fit into this architecture? And as you can see, looking across the top, we have several categories across which you should be thinking if you're in, doing an installation. We have the coverage issue. We have the capacity issue. We have the issue of whether it supports a multi-operator solution. Um, whether it requires sh or d can or cannot share the transport in building. Um, that, that has been a big barrier until relatively recently for, for being able to share the, the fiber, uh, a new fiber riser in a building. The estimated cost compared to a small cell. Now, I'm showing small cells as 1x here, but that's the very newest, latest. Um, and it is inherently tended in the past to be more expensive. But when there's an economy of scale, it may actually be cheaper at the building level. And similarly, where we have multiple technologies, um, 4G, LTE, uh, and you need backward compatibility across multiple technologies, it may be very cost effective. And multiple frequency bands, <clears throat> which as we're seeing over time, this becomes part of what we call a head net, the heterogeneous network with multiple frequencies where you may go to a higher frequency for more capacity over a short distance or a lower frequency to be able to get macro coverage. So small cells and DAS will have a lot of overlap, and the cost will be a key issue. So in many situations, you'll want to cost out both solutions. And one of the other solutions that is coming, particularly from some of the macro cell uh, side focus people, is the cloud RAN, where literally we're remoting the radio head. And to quote one of the, uh, one of the vendors, in many ways, um, DAS can be considered as an evolution of the remote radio head in the sense that DAS can transport data relevant to multiple RF carriers and multiple service providers, but this also means it demands a higher overall link data rate. On the other hand, re remote radio heads can be considered an evolution from DAS. So the cloud RAN is related to DAS, but that extends the coverage not just from legacy base stations. Remote radio heads are now also changing the base station architecture. So when we get to cloud RAN, we're really taking an evolution that extends the, the radio architecture as well as the ability to give better in-building in coverage. And uh, there's an interesting new hybrid solution from a vendor called Airvana One Cell um, that looks like a small cell solution, but it's really more of a cloud RAN where you can have multiple uh, operator uh, remote radio heads in a single configuration. And again, these tend to require high-speed connectivity. Airvana claims to be able to do it over CAT6. Um, these are some of the big issues that will actually eventually reduce the cost of the in-building connectivity, uh, which is going to be one of the significant evolutions probably over the next few years. But with, this is actually, from, from a mature market, this has suddenly turned into a very exciting, innovative market. So let's look at where we are today. And, and these are some very good charts produced by the Small Cell Forum uh, that were published earlier this year in January. Um, the, they looked at whether, in fact, DAS does fit better into some situations than small cells. And on the left-hand side, you see a building uh, with a particular single operator solution where that was all that was required. And they're showing the amount of the uh, small cell versus DAS 
in terms of um, British pounds at this in this chart diagram, um, they're showing the relative cost of the solution. And you can see that there, DAS is consistently the more expensive solution versus small cells for the coverage of that, uh, over the all the different building sizes shown here. But if you look at the right-hand chart where you need to have the multi-operator in building solution, then you are now seeing that there is a crossover point at around um, 12,000 square meters, which is about 120,000 square feet. Um, so where you actually see DAS becoming the lower cost solution. So this exemplifies very nicely, and there's more details on the Small Cell Forum website for this, this analysis. Uh, but you can see that uh, that was where their analysis showed the, the crossover. Um, uh, one of the VPs of engineering at AT&T, Bill Hogg, has suggested the crossover point maps to something of buildings 30 stories or more, which is a little, a little high. Well, I guess it depends how large the, the square feet are. But it's a little, little larger than the, than the Small Cell Forum. Forum study. But still, nonetheless, uh, we're seeing that there is a crossover point, and in doing your analysis for, for customers, it's really important to really look at each individual installation and see whether, uh, if you need a multi-operator solution, which many landlords and, and building owners do want to have, um, that's where you may well have a, a key point at which DAS becomes the cost-effective solution. Spider Cloud, who themselves are selling an integrated small cell and Wi-Fi solution and therefore have their own perspective, um, they're partnered with Vodafone in Europe and with several other operators, uh, but they are helping to do a managed small cell solution that becomes part of the uh, monthly uh, uh, fee that uh, is paid. The, the, the interesting part of their approach to the solution is that the backhaul required for the small cells actually becomes a revenue source for the operator because it becomes part of the mobile fee. Now, that still has to pay off for the customer, but the integration of the backhaul as part of something the mobile operator takes responsibility for, probably reselling it from the wholesale fixed operator. But still, being able to do that, it, it seamlessly has become a part of the, bu the business model. But in their analysis, they're saying that the top 10% of buildings are amenable to DAS more than to small cells. Um, with some of the newer DAS solutions and the better coverage and capacity, it may well be that we get that down to 20%. So this sort of puts DAS in its perspective of where it fits versus small cells. These very large buildings where you do have the kind of square footage as well as the need for the multi-operator solution, where you're going to see some real benefits from DAS. And then just to put it all together and as to how this continuum evolves, we're seeing these new evolution of these new um, solutions with uh, signal boosters, as I mentioned, just playing a small role, but a useful role for office, office buildings where you can actually boost even a 4G signal in, the, in building with, a, with your, an, a, a premise device. And then we have solutions like the Air, Airvana One Cell solution, and one of the key issues here in designing small cells is the intercell borders. And this is an area where DAS itself has a lot of the intelligence to manage these. And the challenges for small cells have really been to not lose a lot of the capacity with the, uh, the overlap and the handover issues between the cells. And that's, uh, this is an example that Ervana provides, but DAS can achieve some of the same solutions today, as indeed can other remote radio head solutions. I mentioned the Ericsson Radio Dot earlier on. But the CloudRAN solutions, uh, which are designed initially for remoting base station, remoting the baseband radio, which remains at the macro cell site from the radi remote radio head that is distributed out to the antenna site, can in fact be also considered as a future in-building solution. So Derek, do you have any other suggestions of new areas where we're going to see an evolution of this DAS architecture? Um, I think one of the things that, that came up during um, some of the questions that have been asked have been in terms of small cell and DAS being utilized together. Um, I see that as, as really a, uh, another area where we may see um, some enhancements, especially as we get more toward a, a more neutral host type small cell um, 
capability, uh, which I, I don't necessarily see that in the short term. Um, I see that more as maybe years down the road. Um, but the the overall thing that we're looking at right now is how do we can we utilize small cells in a in a um, in a DAS system where we can distribute the the signal out uh, further and wider uh, utilizing small cells. And and the key thing with that is understanding your capacity needs and the capacity limitations that you may have from a small cell perspective. Um, the the yeah. neutral host piece is, is, is really a big piece that, that kind of governs that and, and, and how we utilize that. Um, yeah. So those are some of the things that I see on the horizon that, that, that's going to really drive us. And in, 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 in other things that I see are related to the capabilities that we have with regards to small cells and, and even DAS with regards to um, self-optimizing networks. Um, those are some of the big things that I see on the horizon that, that are going to drive us to a better position with regards to that, that heterogeneous network that we, that we talk about a lot in, in terms of having a macro system, DAS, small cell, all having to, to work together to provide the necessary coverage and capacity that we need. Great. Maybe I can now hand it back to Kush to do the question and answer session. Yes, thank you very much for that, um, Sue and Derek. Um, we've actually had quite a few questions come in, so apologies if we don't get to address them. Um, but I am aware that Sue and, um, Sue and Derek have been replying to some of them directly. Um, the first question that we have um, here is asking for strategy advice on small cells versus DAO's deployment. Um, can we start with Derek, please? Um, Chris, what was the question again? Sorry. So the question is asking for strategy advice on small cells versus DAO's deployment. Um, like I said before, the, the biggest thing that I would say from a, a strategy perspective with regards to whether to deploy small cell or DAO is going to be uh, cost. Um, what, is, what, is, what do you have to spend for the deployment? Um, and that typically goes out to our, our customers in terms of how much are you willing to spend to get the coverage and capacity uh, needs that you have in, in, your, in your venue. Um, the second thing I say would be, um, you know, how fast do you, do you want to deploy it? Um, if you have the money uh, to support a DAS and you can wait the amount of time that it requires to deploy a DAS properly, um, and that will probably be your best option. Um, if you want to have something that's a little bit quicker to provide customers with um, limited capacity and more coverage, you know, more coverage per se, um, then I would say small sales will be the way to go. Just, Thank just you. to add it. Just to add a quick comment, um, the title of this webinar was the multi -carrier, key to multi-carrier indoor and public venue mobile coverage. As, as if you are in one of those two carrier two categories where you have a large venue and, a, and especially a public or a semi-public venue, there is probably DAS is the answer today. Um, for a simple, inst or not a simple, but a, a well-proven installation approach to deal with those very large buildings where you must have multi-carrier coverage. So the first step in defining your strategy is, are you in that category? And then look at the cost, as, Eric, as Derek suggested. Thank you, Sue. Um, the second question we have here is, uh, what are your thoughts on Wi-Fi with DADS? Um, I, I've, I've gone through and I, I, I was answering a couple of the questions with regards to Wi-Fi versus DAS. And I think for, for some of our larger venues like, uh, like um, airports, convention centers, uh, stadiums, arenas, I think Wi-Fi implementation along with DAS serves a, serves a great purpose. Um, one, it allows us to not bog down our, our DAS necessarily with a lot of data traffic, which you typically have on your Wi-Fi network. 
and then it, 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 it allows us to have the capacity needs, especially in those times when we have a lot of people in those venues to be able to provide them with the necessary um, uh, voice capacity if needed um, during those times when, when it's, it's heavily, heavily populated. So to me, from a Wi-Fi perspective, um, Wi-Fi and DAS should be complementary um, in a venue. Um, so I, I, I like the fact that we can have both DAS and Wi-Fi in a system. And I would endorse Derek's point about voice over Wi-Fi it may change this picture. Um, as we see um, Vaulty coming in on the wide area, uh, once users have a voice over LTE phone, to increase the footprint of Vaulty rapidly by adding it over the Wi-Fi may be a very attractive solution. Uh, the the Vaulty has this wonderful voice quality, voice over LTE, um, and if you have once you have a Vaulty phone and have experienced it, you're going to want to try and expand where you can use it. And so we fully expect that to happen over Wi-Fi very rapidly. Um, but you may or may not be in a building where you are working with an operator who is offered Vaulty in that region um, or where that operator may not yet have deployed Vaulty. So voice over Wi-Fi may actually act as an extension of voice coverage uh, with the same quality that you get on your home location uh, for your voice calls. So it's another dimension of the re another variable to think about in how you look at the advantages of of DAS, small cells and Wi-Fi depending on where you are in the in the, and where you are in the defaulty deployment capability. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is how is active DAS better than passive DAS? <laughs> um, I, I, w I wouldn't necessarily say active DAS in, in all cases are, are is better than passive DAS. Um, we've had several several scenarios where we've deployed um, active DASs, especially in a, in a stadium scenario, and we deploy passive DASs. And sometimes the passive DASs work better. Um, it's just a it's just a it's a deployment consideration that you need to um, take into consideration. Um, active DASs typically have a little bit higher noise figure that we that we try to that we have to deal with, especially on the uplink. Um, so it's all a it's all a matter of whether or not we can deploy the active active components versus the passive components. So both. Both survey survey general purpose. Um, uh, cost is also impacted by that as well. Pass, passive DAS systems are a little bit cheaper than, than the active DAS systems. So depending upon whether or not you can you have the capabilities to deploy a active system versus a, a passive system is, is key. So I, I don't think there's a really a a better or worse scenario there. Um, it just depends upon if the passive system can be deployed and implemented in a way such that you get the performance that you want. Sue, would you like to add anything to that? Um, I'm, this is not, I'm, I, I take the point that it's really more of a technological constraint of what you can do rather than right. necessarily a choice. Right. right. Um, the next question we have is, can DAS be used as a highway coverage? Um, it it can from an outdoor perspective. Um, however, it, for most general cases, it's not. Um, you would typically use some type of uh, macro implementation for highway coverage, um, due to the mere fact of being able to support a larger coverage area. Um, however, we have deployed outdoor DAS uh, clusters that have covered highways. Um, the next question, Sue, actually came in for you specifically. Um, when do you expect that we will see a neutral host small cell solution? Oh, yeah. This is a tough one because <clears throat> it relates less to, to technology. I think um, this is related to shared networking in general. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> I think one of the first things we may see um, in building is uh, with multiple, it, it, depending on the size of the facility in a public venue, if you imagine a large shopping mall, may well have base stations from small, from multiple vendors, or you may have something like the the Havana One Cell, where you actually have the remote radio that is then backhauled to different vendors, and then Cisco with Ubiquitous has another solution that has requires termination back at the vendors. In some countries, um, I know in the UK it's been easier to do than here, uh, and it relates to the agreements that you need to have to have different uh, RF systems and small cell systems terminate back to the infrastructure of the different mobile operators. So it turns out it's really more of a business issue. Um, there are people who are starting to talk maybe three to five years down the road that we might actually see some shared base stations as we get into some of the newer technologies where we could actually have frequency sharing, um, particularly in a remote location um, or in a stadium where the owner is determining that five vendors will have access or five operators will have access and he wants to be sure that they all are compatible, he may be able to suggest that they have uh, they come up with an architecture that allows them to, to share some of the uh, base station facilities. But at the same time, as, as e-node beef get really cheap, we're, we're expecting them to get very, very inexpensive and proliferate like popcorn. Uh, and as we get some of the spectrum reuse with different operators at different frequencies, we may well see just multiple multi-vendor operations with multiple head nets in the building. And so it, it will very much be up to the venue to decide whether it's important to coordinate or whether, in fact, uh, the operators will eventually come up with a business case. The simplest solution I have come up with is to offer zero-rated in-building roaming because the real reason that this is a challenge if you don't have the operator that you're using in-building is you're going to be paying roaming fees for in-building usage, which most people are not. Uh, willing to pay, especially as corporations are now really the employees are using their mobile phones as their business phone, and so they don't want to pay roaming charges for their primary phone just because they're not at their primary location. Thank you, Sue. Um, the next question we have is, what determines whether a Wi-Fi, DAS, or small cell solution will be used? Can you, say, can you say it again? Because I kind of broke up here. Sorry, that was what determines whether a Wi-Fi, DAS, or small cell solution will be used. Um, I think that kind of goes back to the to a similar question that I answered previously. I mean, it, it's all based upon what a typical uh, venue owner um, needs um, and how much money there is to spend on it and the relative time frame that is needed. Um, Typically, for like I say, a lot of our a lot of our high capacity venues, those are going to be DAS because you know DAS has a more of a of a capacity um, capability than than say a small cell. But um, generally, it's just basically based upon those factors: cost, um, performance needs, and then um, how quickly they want to get it implemented. Yeah, one interesting fact about small cells is I believe 100% of small cells are capable of incorporating a Wi-Fi access point. Now, the challenge of that is it then has to integrate in-building with the existing, existing Wi-Fi in-building. Um, but I fully expect that the operator's interest in having a seamless end-to-end -end Wi-Fi as small cell combinations will in fact uh, accelerate as we see the small cells deployed with the option for operator managed Wi-Fi to come in with the small cells. So we'll see that becoming a, a more integrated part of the solution. Um, we only have time for one more question um, and that is what is the minimum building size you need to have to consider a DAS solution? Um, well, I think I gave I, I, we gave some examples of that. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, um, and, and I, I actually I actually had another slide that that I was going to um, add to this um, to my deck, 
um, but I didn't uh, I didn't add it in. But from a size perspective, um, generally, if you're looking anywhere over, I want to say like 10,000 square feet, um, you know, you can you can equally say depending upon the capacity needs and the and the coverage needs for that building or, or venue, uh, you could either go either way, small cell versus dad. Um, you know, we've seen some dads that are in, you know, those type of scenarios. Mostly for us, I think we're deploying a lot more small cells in, in those buildings that may be under anywhere under 200,000 square feet and below. We, we look at both small cell and dads and kind of ch choose depending upon those, the, the financial piece and the, and the performance piece in terms of what's necessary. So it kind of it kind of just depends upon the 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 need and 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 what what you have to spend on it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Derek and Sue. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining our webinar today. Um, and just a quick update that um, at the Small Cells America Summit that we have the slide open for at the moment, we will be having some sessions running on DAS and small cells. When, and we have speakers coming in from Solid, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and Ericsson. Um, I hope you're able to join us at the event, uh, which will be from the 1st or the 3rd of December in Dallas. Um, please do feel free to contact us for more information on on the event, on the webinar, and also if you'd like to ask any more questions uh, to Sue and also to Derek. Um, thank you again for joining us, and um, we hope to work with you very soon again.